We are sure glad that you've joined us again. It's Sunday afternoon, 3 o'clock, January the 3rd, and we're kind of enjoying our New Year's Eve service tonight. Normally, New Year's Eve, we have a number of our men preach an eight-minute message and do different things. Couldn't do it on New Year's Eve. We're going to do that tonight. We have four men that are going to preach. We're sure looking forward to it. Thank you so many that have come. We had a great attendance in our parking lot this morning. 66 people were here, 29 vehicles. I know that we have many others that are tuning in. I think 16 different ones tuned in on live stream. And so again, we're so glad that you've joined us. Had a good service this morning. Trust that we'll have a great service tonight. Let's open word of prayer and then we'll sing some songs. Let's pray. Father, again, we're thankful that we can gather tonight. Lord, you made some great promises where two or three are gathered together in my name. There am I in the midst of them. And so, Lord, we trust that you're here. I pray you'd help each of these men as they preach tonight. And, Lord, we ask that you would stir our hearts. It's the first Sunday of a brand new year, and we pray that these messages will challenge us and help us to press on for God this year. Help us today, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing some songs. Good afternoon, and as you turn to number 178, just a quick reminder that <clears throat> even if we don't ask for your favorites during the morning service, if you would text your favorites to me sometime in the afternoon, I will use as many of them as possible in the, e the evening or afternoon service. So number 178, Jesus Loves Even Me. I am so glad that our Father in heaven tells of his love in the book he has given. Wonderful things in the Bible I see. This is the dearest that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. I forget him and wander away, still he doth love me wherever I stray. Back to his dear loving arms would I flee, when I remember that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me, Jesus loves me, Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me, Jesus loves even me. Oh, if there's only one song I can sing, when in his beauty I see the great King, this shall my song in eternity be. Oh, what a wonder that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. And for the one favorite that we did get this afternoon, number 375, 375, work for the night is coming, 375. Work for the night is coming, work through the morning hours, work while the dew sparkling work mid springing flowers work when the day grows brighter work in the glowing sun work for the night is coming when man's work is done work for the night is coming stars with labor, rest comes sure and soon. Give every flying minute something to keep in store. Work for the night is coming when man works no more. Work for the night is Last beam fade. 
To number 322. 322, Living for Jesus, number 322.
Then just back a couple pages to number 315. 315, take my life and let it be, number 315. <laughs> service this morning. We had one of our young ladies get baptized at the end of the service, Candace. That would be Rob and Cynthia Craig's daughter. We're sure glad that she took that step of obedience. Folks that we need to pray about, please be in prayer. A number of our people dealing with some health issues. And if you'd pray particularly, if you would also pray for Caleb Allard. A couple weeks ago, he broke his ankle. The doctor said probably take six weeks for him to completely recover and so pray if you would for that. Also, we have a number of missionaries in these next few weeks that are traveling. First of all, the Vanden Herc families, uh, missionaries that we support in England. If they were to fly out today, haven't heard any different. We assume they're on a plane. If you would pray that they would get there safely. And then one of our own men, Brother Rob Craig, who is uh, one of our men preaching tonight, he is uh, fl uh, flying out this coming Friday. And if you would pray that there be no difficulties as he is resuming deputation. And then also we support Wes Neal. He and his wife, they are ministering in Moldova. And that's just a few weeks away that they're flying. I know that some of these missionaries are very anxious to get to the field that God's called them. So we need to pray that the Lord would help them to do that. Also, our church folks know that we're praying for one of our men coming up to an appeal case not this Friday, but next Friday. And we need to pray that the Lord would just grant grace and mercy for the outcome of that. I know that God answers prayer. We need to pray for this dear man. Also continue praying for churches that are without pastors across our country. And if you would, pray for our government. We know that the present restrictions end this coming Friday, and there are sometime this week going to announce what the new guidelines are, and we're just praying that God will turn their hearts to be sympathetic to the needs of Christians and churches and people that need spiritual help at this time. Of course, we'd sure like businesses to open up. Some of our people without work laid off. We need to pray that uh, God would help in these things. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, again, we're grateful that we can gather tonight. We bring to you, Lord, these needs. We pray for some of ours with health issues. Lord, we pray that you'd help them to recover quickly. Father, we pray for Caleb, that that ankle would heal up quickly and properly. Lord, we pray for some of our missionaries that are traveling this week, some to the field that you've called them, others back on the deputation road. We pray that you'd give them good favor, safety, that there'd be no problems or hindrances. Father, we ask that you would direct the government. I know that they're making decisions. They wield a lot of power. 
And Lord, we pray that they would make decisions that would be favorable to churches and to Christians, that we would have the liberty to exercise our faith. Lord, again, we pray that you would help us speak to our hearts tonight. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I know I've mentioned this before. We just finished the year 2020. And if you have kept up with the Bible reading program, please fill it out. Make sure to take a picture of the front and another picture of the back. If you would send those to one of our ladies in the church, Mrs. Pam Lowen, and she'll just keep track of that. If you can't, take a picture of it and at least somehow show it to her or show it to me, show it to my wife. We'll make sure that we relay that information to her. The yellow one, the year 2021, and I trust that you've already begun your Bible reading for this year. We encourage you every day, don't start the day without spending time with God, spending time in His Word. Again, we're sure looking forward to tonight's service. Four of our men are preaching, and as I mentioned this morning, we're now in 2021. We're in a brand new year. If you're writing out a check, make sure the correct date is on that check, if you'd help us with that. This coming week, we have Bible Institute, but just the exams. We have two more time slots for our students to finish their exams this week, Tuesday night at 6, Saturday morning at 10. And so if you're a student still needing to write, please let us know the day before. I know that you have to get them all done by Saturday. We don't have a Wednesday service. We encourage our families to get together in their home Get on the internet, find a Bible preaching message, and be challenged in your heart. This coming Saturday, we're resuming our regular street evangelism. And so whether you want to put tracks in mailboxes or hold up scripture signs, would you come Saturday morning, 1030, come and get your stuff, head on out where the Lord directs you there. I think it's very important this year could be the year the Lord comes back. And we certainly want to be diligent at getting the gospel out next Sunday. We trust by next Sunday we'll have the charitable receipts for last year, also our financial statement. God's been very good to us, and we thank you for your faithfulness in giving. And of course, our annual business meeting, always the second Wednesday night of January, so it's January the 13th. Not entirely sure how we're gonna do it. Much depends on the guidelines and restrictions, but we're looking forward to that. One sat alone beside the highway begging His eyes were blind, the light he could not see He clutched his rags and shivered in the shadows Then Jesus came and bade his darkness flee when Jesus comes, the tempter's power is broken. When Jesus comes, all tears are wiped away. He takes the gloom and fills the life with glory. For all is changed when Jesus comes to stay. So men today have found the Savior able. They could not conquer passion, lust, or sin. Their broken hearts had left them sad and lonely. Then Jesus came and dwelt himself within. When Jesus comes, the tempter's power is broken. When Jesus comes, all tears are wiped away. He takes the gloom and fills the life with glory. For all is changed when Jesus comes to stay. So pilgrim, no. When in this world we're tempted, we have no strength to win the victory. But he is near and wants to fight our battles. Just call his name 
and he will set you free. When Jesus comes, that old tempter's power is broken. When Jesus comes, all tears are wiped away. He takes the gloom and fills the life with glory. For all is changed when Jesus comes to stay. Thank you for that. It's time to take our offering. I know that many of our folks have set it up with their banking that through an Interac e-transfer they can do it. I know that we have others that put uh, money or a check in an envelope and drop it off here sometime during the week. And God bless you for your faithfulness. If you would please listen as we have this offertory plate at this time. Take your hymn books one more time, please, and uh, turn to number 202, 202, My Redeemer, number 202. I will sing of my Redeemer and his wondrous love to me. On the cruel cross he suffered from the curse to set me free. Sing, oh, sing of my Redeemer. With his blood he purchased me. On the cross he sealed my pardon, paid the debt and made me free. I will tell the wondrous story lost to stay to save in his boundless love and mercy he the ransom freely gave sing oh sing of my redeemer with his blood he purchased me on the cross he sealed my pardon paid the debt and made me my dear Redeemer, His triumphant power I'll tell, how the victory He giveth over death and sin and hell. Sing, oh, sing of my Redeemer, with His blood He purchased me on the cross. 
mercy sealed my pardon, paid the debt and made me free. I will sing of my Redeemer and His heavenly love to me. He from death to life and brought me, Son of God, with Him to be. Sing, oh sing of my Redeemer. His blood, He purchased me. On the cross, He sealed my pardon, paid the debt, and made me free. It is preaching time again. I prayed that God would give us four of our men that would preach. Normally, New Year's Eve. We have anywhere between 8 and 18, I think, some years. We've had 22, 23, and so I was praying for four. My children asked me a couple of days ago, Pastor or Dad, what are you going to do if you don't get four? And I said, well, then I'll preach. And my daughter said, Dad, you can't preach in 10 minutes. Well, that almost sounded like a dare. And so I am one of the four. I'm going to be the first one. After me, it's going to be Brother Rob Craig. After him, it's going to be Brother Jeff Weeb. And then finally, Brother Jerry Goble, you get eight to ten minutes. At the seven-minute mark, you will hear this sound. I hope. And at the ten-minute mark, you'll hear this sound. There we go. Now our people are used to that kind of thing, and so uh, if you're not used to that, uh, that's too bad. Look there, if you would, my message to this evening, Revelation chapter number three. Revelation chapter number three. I'd like to read just the first two verses very last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter number 3. And look there, if you would, beginning in verse number 1, Revelation 3, 1. The Bible says, And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that is the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain, that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Let's pray. Father, would you help us tonight? Speak to us from all four messages. May we hear from heaven. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You know that the author of Revelation is John. John wrote the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and then the book of Revelation. This book is the very last book of our Bible in the Bible. It's also the very last book of the Bible that was written. John was exiled to an island because he wouldn't stop preaching. While he was on that island, God told him, I want you to write letters to seven different local churches that were alive in that time. We're looking here at Revelation chapter 3, and this happens to be the fifth of those seven churches. We're told there, look in verse number 1, and unto the angel of the church in Sardis. So this church is in the city of Sardis. Pastor, what do we know about this city of Sardis? Well, it was a capital city. It was a very wealthy city. It was founded about 1200 BC. It was located on the top of a plateau. There were cliffs on three sides of this plateau, the only way to enter this city of Sardis was there was a narrow winding road on the fourth side of this cliff. You can imagine how confident that these people in this city were. They were so sure that nobody would be able to break into that city. And that as much as it was an advantage, it was a disadvantage. It was a disadvantage because it caused them to be overconfident. It caused them to be sure that they had nothing to worry about. You know, in the history of that city of Sardis, we're told that the Persians, one of the enemies, decided, I want to conquer that city. And so the Persian king, Cyrus, sent some spies around the base of that mountain and he said to those spies, I want you to watch. I want you to observe. Somewhere we're going to find their weakness, and that's how we'll conquer them. Do you know, sure enough, one of those days, 
one of those spies looking up at that mountain noticed that one of the soldiers that was walking on the top of that wall, he leaned over a little too far and his helmet fell off of his head, tumbled down to the bottom of that mountain. Now the spy was paying extra careful. He was looking extra close. And lo and behold, a few minutes later, he found that same soldier who came walking down a hidden path that couldn't be seen to rescue his helmet and to return back up top there. And that spy knew, I have found the way to break into the city. Sure enough, that night, Cyrus and his army, with that, their troops, they followed that hidden path. And that night, they conquered that city. And you know, it never was restored again to the greatness that it once had. That's talking about the city of Sardis. This letter is written to the church of Sardis. I want you to notice what it says about the church that was in this city. Verse number one, and unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God, and the seven stars, I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest, and art dead. Do you know this church had a great reputation? People often talked about the church at Sardis. Maybe they had great revivals. Maybe they had great meetings. Maybe they had great speakers. Maybe out of that church was sent some great missionaries to do great works. He said, you had a great name. But he said, you're dead. You say, Pastor, when a church gets like that, what do you do? Preacher, do you give up? Do you just leave a church once they're in their shadowy years of being a great church at one time? Do you just stop? Do you just give it all up? Look at verse 2. Revelation 3 and verse 2 was John's advice to this church. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. Real quickly, I've only got five minutes left. Real quickly, my title, How to Get Back to Where Things Were. How to get back to where things were. Maybe this evening you'd have to admit, Pastor, I'm saved. I know we can't lose our salvation. But, Pastor, spiritually, I'm not where I once was. I think that we'd have to be honest that many churches and many Christians in those churches over these last 10 months during this period of COVID that there are many a church and many a Christian that has lost ground. Pastor, how do I get back? How do I get back as a Christian? How do I get back? We get back as a church very quickly. Look there in verse number two. John's first piece of advice is be watchful. Do you know that word watchful means to stand, uh, stay awake, to be alert? In Old Testament times, the city that had walls around it, they'd set on those walls a watchman. And that watchman's job was just to be observant and to notice, to see if there was any danger that it was a distance away. We know that there are passages in the Bible where watchmen did what they were supposed to do. When they noticed that something was not right, they announced that to those in the city. We also know that the Bible records some watchmen that did not do what they were supposed to do. Do you know the very first thing that John says is you're going to have to make some honest observations. Now, you know the hardest thing to do is to be honest about yourself. Could you honestly say, no, my spiritual life is better than it ever has been before? Well, if that's true, that's great. But if it's not true, you're not even being honest with yourself. First step is that you're going to have to make some honest observations. You still reading your Bible faithfully? Still praying? Church still important? God's people still a priority? I give you the second thing. Look there in verse number two again. He said, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. Okay, if you can be honest enough to say, you know what, I'm not where I was. I've lost some ground. Can you understand that you are on a slippery slope and if you have lost ground up to now, it's not going to stay there. 
Notice he said there, and are ready to die. Do you understand? It's not going to stop where you've already lost ground. It's going to continue to go where a second thing, you're going to have to acknowledge the slippery slope. If you're not reading your Bible every day now, if you say, preacher, I'm only reading it twice a week, you'll be in worse shape next month. Say, pastor, I haven't been in church in months. You're going to be in worse shape in six months. First of all, you need to make some honest observations. Secondly, you are going to have to uh, not only make some honest observations, you're going to have to acknowledge a slippery slope. But look at the third thing real quick. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain. You're going to see, really, I've lost ground in my Bible. What am I going to do about it? You have to do something. Do you know when an ambulance comes rushing into a hospital and they hurry that person into the emergency room, the doctors don't say, it'll fix on its own. Those doctors say, quickly, bring the oxygen, quickly, bring the tools, quickly. I say to you a third thing, you're going to have to send reinforcements right away. I wonder how you're doing in your Christian life. You say, preacher, it's never been as good as it is today. That's a great blessing. But I fear that not everybody can say that. Can you say it? First of all, you'll have to make some honest observations. Secondly, you are going to have to, uh, sorry, you are going to have to uh, acknowledge the slippery slope. And then you're going to have to send reinforcements right away. Father, please help us. If we've lost ground, may we begin by being honest. Say, Lord, I'm not where I once was. I need your help. And if I don't do something right now, it'll only get worse. Help me. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, uh, turn into your Bibles, uh, 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19. Uh, we're going to open up with uh, verse number 1, and uh, we'll talk to the Lord, and uh, we'll get into it. 1 Kings chapter 19, uh, verse number 1. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and with all he, how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Uh, Lord, again, we, uh, we love you, and we thank you, Lord. We thank you for this, uh, this new year. And, and I pray, Lord, as we look with uh, hope and anticipation, and a fervency, Lord, I pray that we would remain that way even to, by, to the end of the year. And again, I just pray that you bless now our, our quick time here together. In Jesus' name, amen. And, you know, Pastor talked about uh, Sardis, and that was church number five. Uh, but the last church uh, is uh, Laodicea. And I believe that's the period that we're in right now. And uh, what happens, uh, the Bible tells us that uh, we know that there's going to be a great falling away, and, but there's also going to be a, a, a great apostasy. And... Um, Again, you know what, I'm sure when we started this new year, uh, we didn't ever think, or even last year, let's go back to last year, 2020. Uh, I wonder how many started 2020 last year uh, thinking that perhaps they would never have quit by the end of that year. And sadly, as I drove around the States, uh, that was the case. Uh, I don't know how many times I heard pastors say, you know what, I've only got a third of my congregation, a quarter of my congregation, half. I don't know where they are. Uh, no, sadly, uh, they have not returned. And I imagine as pastors went into uh, 2020 last year that it never ever it dawned on them that they would have to permanently shut the doors. But some did. Again, they quit. You know, it seems that we all have good intentions, but how long do those good intentions last? You know, I'm sure that many, if not all, and I hope all of us uh, going into this new year would never even consider us not being here by the end of 2021. You know, I've heard preachers say that how you bring in the new year is usually how you're going to end that same year. But, you know, sadly for some, that's not the case. Again, some have started serving God. Uh, they've read their Bible and they've prayed and, and they've done all those things that they can for the year. But, you know, what? by the time the end of the year uh, wraps up, uh, they're not doing those things anymore. And again, sadly, because of what the Bible says, they have fallen. Uh, they become a statistics. And what the uh, Bible says in First Timothy chapter four, and Second Timothy chapter three, and Second Timothy again, these all these these uh, books of the Bible here that I'm mentioning talk about an apostasy, a falling away, a great falling away, for which we know we are in those last days. Second Thessalonians, and you know, so I want to preach on this title: uh, If not careful, you'll quit too. And you know, somebody said this: the only way you fall out of something. Uh, is by being on the edge of it. 
And I don't know how many times we've heard, and I've heard this, the, the term, you know, uh, they're on the fringe, they're on the cuff, and all those types of things. And it doesn't take usually too much for somebody to uh, fall off of that thing of what they were doing. And so, uh, again, we're looking at Elijah. Again, this is familiar. It's not strange to anybody else. But I want us to consider, firstly, if not careful, uh, you'll separate yourself. In verses number 3 and 4, uh, is, and, when, uh, and when he saw that he rose and he went for his life and came uh, to Beersheba, uh, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. Uh, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree and requested for himself that he might die. And said, it is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better uh, than my father's. Again, the first thing, if you're not careful, you will separate yourself. And we need to be careful, uh, especially in the times in which we are living right now. Uh, you know, we're, we, uh, we're down to parking lot services, and I realize that it's easy uh, for some to just stay home and everything else and everything else. But if you get into that habit, uh, you'll find yourself separated from yourself we need to be with the brethren. That's where we get strength and that's where we get encouraged. That's where we get help. Ecclesiastes, the preacher, Solomon said, you know, again, two. Two of them can help each other. If one fall, guess what? The other one can help them up. We, we ought to be careful that we do not separate ourselves. Elijah, you know, he had the presence of God, the power of God, protection of God, and provision of God. Yet we find uh, that he quit on God. And you know what? And none of us are greater than Elijah. Again, where Elijah had victory, soon came defeat. And then with testing comes, you know, the blessing. Again, you know, the Christian life is full of mountains and valleys. We will be on the mountaintop one day. We could be in the valley the next day. But you know what? Uh, we can get out of that valley, and we need to get out of that valley quickly. Uh, we don't have to stay in there. But you know what? Most times we keep ourselves there. Again, you know, God will bless, but then he's going to test. And so, so we quickly we've seen, don't isolate yourself. Second mistake uh, we would find uh, for somebody, you know, if you're not careful, you'll quit too, is you're going to overestimate your worth. And that was a problem with Elijah. You know, he thought he was God's gift to the ministry. Uh, we find in 1 Kings, uh, if you just turn back, or it might be on the same, but in 1 Kings 18.22, it says, Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I, only remain a prophet of the Lord, uh, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. And uh, 1 Kings 19.10, again, he says the same thing, how he thinks that uh, he's the only one. Uh, but you know what? we got to remember that um, if you're a preacher, whether you're a Sunday school teacher, a uh, piano player, a song director, whatever you are, you got to realize that there was somebody before you, and there will be somebody after you. And so we ought not to lift ourselves again in... Uh, the Bible says, wherefore to him that thinketh he standeth, take heed lest he fall. we got to be careful. You know, pride usually crumbles... To, reun uh, to ruin. You know, thirdly, it have us to consider is uh, if you're not careful, you'll begin to feel sorry for yourself. You'll feel sorry for yourself. You know, uh, Elijah, he had a pity party. Again, in, in verses, uh, verse number three and verse number four, uh, you know, he saw, he rose uh, again. You know what, that, uh, and it says there, when he saw that he arose, you know, it was only Jezebel that only said, you know, by this time tomorrow, you know, you're going to be dead. So what is it that he saw? You know, everything that he saw, he saw when, uh, when God took care of all those prophets of, of Baal and all that stuff. What he saw was the fact that they didn't learn from that. Uh, you know, that nobody, nobody turned to God and all those types of things. Uh, they still continued in their wickedness. Again, he didn't see a change. But you know what? He fled that thing and he left his servant and he said, you know what? God kill me. Isn't, isn't it true? Uh, you know, uh, we think of Jonah and others that just had a pity party. Uh, Jeremiah in, uh, in, in uh, chapter, verse, uh, sorry, chapter 20, verse 9, uh, he temporarily quit on the Lord. Uh, but you know what? The word was in him and it burned and it burned and you know, he got back in the race. But again, you know what? A high maintenance Christian will think nobody cares. Nobody cares. You know, I was sick and nobody called me when I was home. I was in the hospital, but no one came and visited me. You know, but again, somebody that's right with God, you know, they'll want you to pray for them. They'll call somebody and say, hey, could you pray for me about this? Again, when you think uh, it's not about you, you'll leave. Fourthly, I'd have us consider, again, if you're not careful, uh, you're going to hide from the responsibilities of God. Again, 1 Kings chapter 19, 8 and 9, uh, Elijah was going down. You know what? He was going in the wrong direction. After he did eat, uh, in verse number 9, at the end of it, it says, well, what doest thou here, Elijah? See, Elijah was going the wrong way. And again, when you get to thinking, 
uh, and pity party and everything else, you're going to start going the wrong way. And usually it's out the back door. You know, if God tells you to stop something, you stop it. If God tells you to start something, start it. Again, whatever God lays on your heart, uh, it's your responsibility to do it. We need to do it. Again, he doesn't want you to do. If he doesn't want you to do it, he'll stop you. So again, quickly, again, we, got, we, uh, we just considered uh, hid from his responsibilities. Isn't in it true? Um, when we get in, that, in that, that pity party, we will. You know, Elijah also, uh, um, if we're not careful, um, he didn't discern the help of the Lord. In verses 5 through 7, uh, you know, as he lay and he slept underneath that juniper tree, uh, behold, an angel touched him and said, Arise and eat. And, you know, and he looked at that thing and he said, uh, There was a cake bacon and there was a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and they drank and he laid it down again. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. You know, he ate and he went back to sleep with no concern about the journey ahead. Again, the, the angel told him, Hey, pay attention. You're not going to be able to survive this thing uh, if you don't nourish yourself and take care of yourself. Again, we need to be careful. If we don't discern the, uh, the help of the Lord, whether it's counsel through a pastor, maybe another church member that's a little older, a little wiser. Uh, I, I've had instances when I was on deputation uh, that the Lord w- was, would use somebody and they would say something and the Lord would say, take heed. And sure enough, it would be with vehicle problems or, or something like that. I had a tire that was just about to blow out, but I took it in and got it in. And sure enough, it had a big bulge and everything like that. But that, but that somebody had said he had a problem with the same van, the same year and everything else like that. Again, I, I just took heed to that thing. You know, a sixth mistake for Elijah was, uh, you know, he felt like God owed him something. And, you know, we need to be careful if we get like that. In uh, verses 19, 10, he said, you know, again, Elijah thought uh, he was the only one, but uh, God humbled him and said, no, no, I've reserved 7,000 for me. Again, you know, God doesn't owe us one thing. If saved then, uh, he, we owe him everything. Again, quitters never win and winners never quit. And uh, I read this about a uh, missionary. It, you can uh, pertain this to, a, uh, uh, to anybody, but some of the finest for missionaries. <laughs> Uh, my opening text doesn't come from 1 Peter chapter 3. First, I want to thank Pastor for giving us the opportunity to preach. It's always an honor. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 12 and verse number 15, we're going to read, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are opened unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Number 15, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you'd use these minutes to encourage your people. Amen. This text here starts with the, uh, says the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. What a great promise. Not only that, but it says his ears are open unto their prayers. Then verse number 15, it says, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. You know, God wants your heart sanctified. He wants it set aside. He wants it clean. He wants it ready for use. Some people that maybe are just a bit lazy, they don't do the dishes and they pile up and then when they need a dish, they go and look and they look for the dish that they want and then they have to go and clean it before they use it, but God wants you in the cupboard ready for him when he read, wants to use you. Um, not only that, it says that he, was, he wants you to be ready to tell others of the hope that is in you. Why are you so hopeful? What keeps you going? I want to focus today on the word hope. What is your hope? What keeps you going? Why do you keep coming to church? Why do you keep reading your Bible? Why do you witness? Why don't you just take the easy road? Why do you give tithes and offerings and into missions? Why do you live differently than this world? We do it because of a hope that lieth inside of us. If you're saved, you have the hope of eternal life. If you're saved, you have the hope of hearing, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You know, some people, they have a misplaced hope. 
They have their hope in the wrong place. The first one is that some have misplaced their hope in a delayed second coming. Some Christians believe that Christ is coming back, but they live as though they have lots of time. In Matthew, uh, Christ warned of this. He says, um, Matthew chapter 24, verse 48 says, But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants and eat and drink with the drunken. You know, these people, they're not concerned about the Lord coming back. They live like they have lots of time just to party and enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Second one I want you to see is some misplace their hope in their diverse riches. They think that their money is going to save them when the troubles come. But Proverbs warns against that. It says, Proverbs eleven twenty eight says, He that trusteth in his riches shall fall, but the righteous shall flourish as a branch. You know that uh, King David had lots of money, but in Psalms 20, or 20 verse 7 it says, Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. You know, some misplace their hope in a dogmatic leader. If only Trump can stay in power, then things will get better. If only we could get rid of Trudeau, then we can turn this nation around. But Psalms 146.3 says, Put not your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, in whom there is no help. You know, we've been blessed to have some leaders that have slowed down the agenda of the left. I believe that Harper was a good leader for Canada, but he is not the hope of Canada. I believe that Trump has done some good things for the U.S., but he's not the hope for the United States. In fact, verse number three says, in whom there is no help. If you're trusting a man, your hope is in the wrong thing. Psalms 118.8 says, it is better to trust in the Lord than put your confidence in man. Number four, some misplace their hope in their diligent accomplishments. Solomon was an accomplished king. He built a great kingdom. His fame was worldwide. Yet in Ecclesiastes 1.14 says, I have seen all the works that are done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. You know, when you lose hope, you do some crazy things. In Acts chapter 16, verse 19, read a story here. It says, when her master saw the hope of their gains was lost, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers. Here were some men here in Acts that were using this poor girl and she was making the money and when she could no longer do that, they lost hope and they reacted in the wrong way. If there should have been anyone in this story that lost hope, it should have been Paul and Silas. It says they were beaten with many stripes. They were thrust into the inner prison. They're, they were fastened, their feet were fastened in the stocks, yet they didn't lose hope. The Bible says at midnight... I believe they couldn't sleep. They were probably in a lot of pain and discomfort. Yet they began to pray and to sing praise to God, and God came through for them. Remember our opening text, for the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous. So where does our hope come from? Number one, our hope comes from our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy 1 verse 1 says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. You and I need to work on our relationship with Christ. We need to spend time with him each day, praying and praising and worshiping him. Number two, our hope comes from God's holy word. Romans 15 verse 4 says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Your time in God's word is so important. It is important that you keep reading it, that you keep listening to it, that you meditate on it, and that we hide it in our hearts, it will give us hope. Number three, our hope comes from the saints of God. First Thessalonians 2 verse 17 says, But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavoring the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. And verse number 19 says, For what is our hope? or joy, or crown of rejoicing, are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming. Here Paul is speaking to the Thessalonians, and he has a longing to be with them, 
to see their faces. You know, it's just good to see people's faces when they come to church. It'd be so much better if we could all be in this building and see each other up close without a mask on. But even still, just being out there and seeing people's faces is just a real encouragement. It makes a difference. You know, when you see other Christians who are making an effort to assemble, even when it's awkward and when it's inconvenient and when it's risky, it allows us to see us, our faces. You know, there was a thud airplane pilot in the Vietnam War who was shot down. The pilot was captured by the Viet Cong, and for months they beat him and abused him. He finally broke down and signed a confession that they had treated him well as a POW, and this was an unjust war that the U.S. was wrong for fighting it. He was so discouraged, he wanted to die. And one day he was sitting in a cell with no hope. Another American called out to him. And this American said, hang in there. We're going to get out of this thing. And you know what? His hope was renewed. And you know, he hung, out, hung in there and he was released and later um, lived to tell about it. You know, Christians are losing hope. They're taking a beating from this world and they need your encouragement. They need to see you in the fight. They need to know that even when others are quitting, you're going to stand there for Christ. 1 Thessalonians 4.13 says, But I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope. If you are saved, if you know Jesus Christ is your personal Savior, you have hope. We just need to keep our eyes on the Lord. We need to stay in his word. We need to continue to assemble with other believers. I want to leave you this one last verse. Romans 15, verse 13. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Thank you for the hope that you bring to our lives. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, if you could open your Bible up to Genesis uh, chapter 17, please. Genesis chapter 17, I'd like to read one, one verse. Uh, let's look there in Genesis 17 and verse number 5. Verse number 5, the Bible says this, Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For in father of many nations have I made thee. Let's pray, Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity and privilege to preach. Pray that you direct what I say, Lord. Use what I say for your glory, or don't let me say it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, uh, this here is the account of the man that God called out of Ur of the Chaldees, and he used this man in a great way. Eventually, the nation of Israel came out of this man. This was a turning point in Abraham's life. That verse says that God told him, Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. Do you realize that from this verse, Genesis 17, verse 5, never again was that man referred to as Abram. It was finished. From now on, it was fixed. It was Abraham, Abraham. You never hear him referred to as Abram. That was a turning point in the Bible and for that man. Now, in the same way, that that man's name was never Abram, now fixed, locked in to being Abraham. Do you know if you're saved today, the moment that you trusted Jesus Christ, you immediately, immediately, you have now got a new nature, you have a new name in the Lamb's Book of Life, you have a new home, new Jerusalem, it's fixed, it's locked in. Never again do you have to worry and question, I wonder where I'm... If you're saved, you're going. It's, it's locked in. Now, maybe I'm talking to someone right now. The only time that you move your Bible is when you're dusting with that little feather thing under the coffee table and it touches it too hard. That's the only time. Maybe I'm talking to somebody right now. You're saved, but you got a sin that you just cannot get over. Can I tell you, when you got saved, just like Abraham, you're going to heaven. Maybe I'm talking to someone right now, you got a past, you wish nobody finds out, you hope that you never were there or did that or participated in those things. Listen, if you trusted Christ, be, be, regardless of that, you're on your way to heaven. It's fixed. Um, now, 
the Bible says this over there in Colossians 2.10. It says about Christians, ye are complete in him. You know what that means? That means the man that got saved and somewhere in there he got put out with Christians. Somewhere in there he got mad at God. Somewhere in there he stopped reading his Bible. Somewhere in there he just went off into the far country and he's been there for years. If that guy trusted Christ, he is as locked in to going to heaven as the guy that's in church three times a week and he's doing all the right things. I know that flies in the face of some, but that's just, you're complete. The one guy isn't more saved than the other guy. Okay, now that's, uh, that's now turn to Genesis chapter 32. Genesis 32 and verse 28. Genesis 32, here's another man. This is the grandson of, uh, of Abraham. Genesis chapter 32, look there in verse 28. Same scenario. He, Jake, Jacob's wrestling with this angel. Verse 28, and he said, this angel, thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. Did you see that? In the same way, no more Abram locked in to, is, to Abraham. Jacob is told, no more Jacob, now it's Israel. You know what the interesting thing is? Jacob is referred to as Israel 40 times between this verse, Genesis 32, 28, to the end of Genesis. Do you know he's called Jacob 74 more times? <laughs> you say, wait a minute, I thought his name changed. Oh, it did, it did. It's just that this is what Jacob means. Jacob means supplanter. And a supplanter, that's somebody that always tries to get in the front through treachery, deceit. And, and Jacob does just that. Look at Genesis 33, verse 1. This is after you could call his altar of conversion. Verse, verse 1, and Jacob lifted up his eyes, and looked, behold, Esau came, and with him 400 men. You know what he starts doing? He starts dividing up the children and the wife. He starts, but old Jacob, he's doing the same thing. A little while later, in verse number 14 of Genesis 33, uh, Esau says, now, okay, I'm going to head on up to Mount Seir, and you follow me, okay, Jacob? And, and Jacob says, yes, sir, and they hug, was pre-COVID. They hug, and they shake hands, and they say, all right, we're gone. And they get going up there, and you know what Jacob did? The very first exit he got to, it said Sukkoth. He said, honey, we're out of here. And he, ex he you lying weasel. That, he's back to the same thing. You know what? That's just like us Christians. You get saved, locked in, just like Abraham, going to heaven. But we got two natures, man, and those two natures, one of them could be that old man is still rising up and get just like Jacob. And other times, that new man, the, the Christ in you, the hope of glory, he gets the victory. And the question is, I ask you today, uh, I, wonder, I wonder who's getting the victory in your life. You know, about seven years later in Jacob's life, uh, look there in Genesis chapter 35, verse number 2. Genesis 35, 2, seven years later, after you could say he got saved. I'm not changing Israel for the church or church for Israel. I'm just using this as a type of people get saved, type of people with two natures. Look at Genesis 35, verse 2. Then Jacob said unto his household and all that were with him. Uh, now, watch the reverential, solemn voice. Put away the strange gods that are among you and be clean and change your garments. <laughs> sure sounds good, doesn't it? Before we give him too much credit, look at why he was in Bethel. Verse number one. And God said unto Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel. And <laughs> God said, Listen, Buster, you remember what happened back there in Genesis 32, 28? You've been living the same way you were, you were living before. You get up to the get back to church, get back to me, get back and get right. And Jacob says, Okay, he does. Now <laughs> you remember how uh, remember how uh, Moses burnt that golden calf years later that they were worshiping? Watch what Jacob does after God tells him you better get right. We're gonna get right. Look at the look what he does with all the false gods that he, his family had. Genesis thirty five, verse four at the end. And Jacob hid them under the oak. <laughs> You know, that's like, you know, taking the cigarettes and putting them in the you know, cupboard under the sink. So, you know, when you got company and you really, pressure gets on, uh, I, I need to smoke. And you go there and light up and you got the fan, you got the hairspray. You don't have that dissipates the smoke. Or he hides a Mickey of whiskey up in the closet. You know, the preacher won't look there and hopefully the kids won't see it. That's Jacob. That's that old nature that's rising up and saying, I know what happened back there in Genesis 32, 28. Uh, now, you know what? By the time Jacob gets to see Pharaoh, years later, he stands before that king of Egypt and he says, few and evil are the days of my, the, uh, the years of my life. That's few and evil. Now, isn't that sad? You say, why? He let that old nature run him. Do you know, 
Uh, there is many a Christian, now listen to what I say, there's many a Christian whose sins are washed in the blood. They've been placed into the body of Christ. They're spiritually circumcised. They're on their way to heaven just as well as you, you and I. And at the end of their life, they say the same thing as Jacob. Few and evil are the days of the years of my life. You say, why is that? I'll tell you why. After they got saved, they held on to bitterness. They held on to unforgiveness. After they got saved, they wanted the attention of what they own, what they made, where they traveled. They wanted people to say, look at me. Listen, (laughs) get the attention off of that old Jacob and get it on to the new man onto the Lord Jesus Christ that saved you. And, uh, and I say to you, there, here's, here's the contrast. I read somewhere that George Whitfield, old preacher from back, I think, in the 19th century, that man, when he was on his deathbed, he said this. He quoted Psalm 17:5, And that verse says, As for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. As he stepped into eternity, his breath got shorter and shorter, and eventually he just said, Satisfied satisfied. Now let me ask you, we got a new year, and incidentally, this COVID thing, this virus, that has not altered, minimized, or negated any truth in this Bible, nothing. And uh, we have a new year in front of us, and with that new year, at the end of this year, I wonder if, if someone could see the record, would they say, see you as Jacob, that old carnal self, that old conniving, weasel-like individual getting the preeminence? Or would they see that new man, the Lord Jesus Christ, the hope of glory that's in you, would they see that getting the preeminence? That's the choice. That's the challenge. I wonder what you're going to do. That's um, that new year. I wonder if that new nature is going to get the preeminence. Or is it going to be like Jacob? (laughs) Few and evil. You don't want that in a year's time. You want to be able to say, satisfied satisfied let's pray uh father that's i don't know if that truth got through but lord it's pretty clear when a man or woman gets saved they're fixed for heaven just as surely as abraham's name was fixed never to change but at the same time when we get saved we still have a will lord and father we could make or break how we please you how our lives turn out how this year turns out by what we do, who we give the preeminence to. And Lord, I'm talking to some Christian who maybe is holding on to bitterness or unforgiveness, someone who's looking for the preeminent, trying to get the attention on them instead of their Savior. I pray they'd recognize that, oh my, it's so much better to give it to God, live for Jesus, surrender to him, walk with him. And Father, at the end, we can say like George Whitfield, satisfied, satisfied. All right. Your heads bowed and your eyes closed as the piano plays a very familiar hymn, Take My Life and Let It Be, Consecrated, Lord, to Thee. You have a whole year ahead of us now. No matter what last year was like, you have a brand new start. You can't make it work without Christ. If you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior, you need to do that. You need to do that today. But if you're saved... Are you willing to let him take your life, your hands, your feet, your riches, your time, your ambitions, your goals? Would you give all those to him this year, tonight?
Father, again, we thank you for the privilege of a new year, and I pray that you'd help us direct our steps. May we be sensitive to your direction in our lives. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us to fix our hope on Jesus Christ, not on the things of this world. Lord, I pray that you would help us and pray that every step that we take this year would be a step that pleases you. Father, we thank you for each one, for the faithfulness of so many tonight. Take us home, guide us in the days ahead. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for coming. You are dismissed.